Next will be Dr. Mary Helen Barsaloff. Uh, she is senior scientist and deputy, uh, deputy director of the Life Sciences Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And she will be talking this time about the cancer side of stem cells. Her talk is entitled Stem Cells in Breast Development and Cancer. Please welcome Dr. Barsaloff. Good morning. I'm going to switch uh, topics completely, and I'm going to try to get this thingy to work. <laughs> Did you do that? <laughs> okay. Um, mainly because I have a lot. Of, see what happens? Um, I have a lot of animation in my slides, and so we're going to have to try to get this to go in a kind of seamless fashion. So I'm going to talk about something slightly different. I'm interested in breast cancer. I'm interested in the origin of breast cancer. And right now, there's an interesting link between stem cells in the breast and cancer stem cells. And I'm going to try to de define for you the different types of stem cells and how these two concepts are linked, OK? I'm not interested right now in coming to a conclusion. I think the, the question is still open. But I, what I hope to present to you is some of the ideas um, behind the, idea, uh, the, the demonstration of, of stem cells in the breast, and then some of the ideas that lead us to uh, draw parallels between true tissue-specific stem cells and breast cancer stem cells. So as you've already heard, uh, we have at least complete agreement on these two features of stem cells. They're able to self-renew, and they're able to generate all the differentiated cells represented in that specific tissue. So in the breast, what we're interested in is actually the composition of the epithelial cells, the cells that make milk in a long term, uh, well, under the hormones of pregnancy. And it's a relatively system, a simple system. If you compare it to bone marrow or the brain, where there are some hundreds of different types of stem cells, I mean, uh, different types of, of, of specific cells. In the breast, there are really only um, a couple of types. So I'm going to quickly go through that. So we have the idea that there's a stem cell that's able to self-renew. Next is a pluripotent cell that has a restricted differentiation potential that can give rise to, in this case, what I've depicted is essentially the luminal epithelial cells of the breast, which actually can go on to produce more and more cells. So in the next, um, so that's called a lineage restricted. And one of the lineage restrictions that I'm going to indicate here is the ER positive status of a cell. Um, that's something that many of you who are familiar with breast cancer know that whether a, a breast tumor is ER positive or negative um, predicates the decisions on how to treat that tumor. In the case of the epithelium, what's important of, of the mammary gland is that the estrogen receptor positive cell is the one that differentiates to receive the signal um, that is given off by the ovaries that produce estrogen, right? And so what happens when those cells receive that signal, next slide, is that some cells um, go on to proliferate and create many, many cells. And others, like the ER-positive cells, actually proliferate very little. But it's important that the ER-positive cell receives that signal and then sends the signal to other cells. So there's an interplay between these two compartments of the breast. So that just gives you kind of a rough schematic of how these, uh, the mammary epithelium is actually uh, defined as a functional tissue. And we know that there's a stem cell in that, mainly because of work with mice. So in the next slide, I depict for you the mouse mammary development. It's important to recognize that in the breast, I think we all recognize, the breast develops postnatally under the hormones of puberty. That's true in the mouse as it is in the human. But the really important thing about it is not only the outward appearance of development, but the internal appearance of development or the development of tissue. And so the mammary gland is, is unique in that the main differentiation of the, the tissue, i.e. the epithelium, occurs under the hormones of puberty. So at birth, there's just a little, there's a, a fat pad, the, uh, which is the, the supporting tissue of the um, mammary gland. And then I've indicated a big green blob there, which is just a marker that we use in, in mouse mammary, but it's a lymph node, um, which just represents one of the tissue compartments. And there's just a little bud of epithelial cells. These are the cells that can give rise to the whole mammary 
uh, gland. And what happens under the hormones of puberty, next slide, is they develop a, you're gonna have to pay really close attention now. Next slide. <laughs> okay, is that these, uh, forms these specialized structures called end buds. These end buds actually do this migration. They move out into the mammary gland until um, they reach the end, um, where, which is called the ductal outgrowth, at which point the end buds actually, um, in the, at the edge of the tissue actually regress, so that's why they're hollow out there. Uh, but the rest of them just keep going until um, they reach the absolute ends of the, the fat pad. So they've then made this what we call the ductal tree. The ductal tree of the mature gland will sit there um, and kind of maintain itself for the rest of the woman's life. But if the woman then becomes pregnant, or in this case the mouse, what happens is there's this huge burst of proliferation and another layer of differentiation in which the cells now acquire the ability to make milk um, and that's called alveolar differentiation. It's represented in this case by this little uh, kind of checkerboard because I got tired of drawing things. But what it means is that there's this huge expansion of epithelium. Those epithelial cells now can make milk. Now when the animal uh, weans its pups, then what happens next is an involution of that process. So all those cells go away. The gland returns to a kind of quiescent state, normal ductal tree, no milk being produced, but what's really interesting about the mammary gland is that this cycle of differentiation and proliferation can occur over and over and over and over again. So in a mouse, so I, I'm giving you a nice little cartoon, well, relatively nice little cartoon, uh, and, but in a mouse, I wanted to give you just what this actually looks like, and so the next slide shows um, the actual organ. Mouse have, mice have uh, 10 mammary glands. This is just one of them, and what we're depicting here are those phases of differentiation that I just described for you. So over here we have the very early um, uh, mouse. If I stand a little bit to the side, maybe I can point and you can still hear me. Um, so we have just this little bud. So here's this lymph node that I described earlier, and you'll see it in each of these glands. It's just a kind of a marker. Um, and so next slide you'll see that there's this little region here is this epithelial bud that's present at birth, and that's what it looks like at a higher magnification. And then as the animal enters puberty, you see these little ducts that begin to grow out. Those are the end buds that I pointed out. This is a mature gland. You see how it gets more and more developed. Actually, this is an animal uh, during pregnancy, and this is actually a lactating tissue. So you see it's grown extensively. And as I just told you, when those animals or the pups are weaned, that will involute. It'll go back to looking like this but it can do it over and over and over again. Now, how do we know that this, this complex process of differentiation and proliferation is due to stem cells? So uh, one of the advantages of mice is that we can manipulate them in ways that we wouldn't um, do so with humans. So in the next slide, I'll show you what we're actually uh, able to do. Next, please. Um, which is the functional test for stem cells. Now, this was a technique that was developed in the, mid, uh, in the late 1950s uh, at UC Berkeley by Ken Deom and colleagues, and it's been used extensively to show that the mammary gland has differentiation potential associated with a stem cell compartment. So keep in mind that the idea of a stem cell is, is an old idea. It's not, it's not a recent invention. Um, and this is one of the ways that you demonstrate it. So if the next slide, or the next part, will show you again our, lymph, our, our mammary gland with the lymph lymph node and the little epithelial duct. And as I told you, under the hormones of puberty, um, this little epithelial duct will begin to grow out. But what we can do in a mouse is we can come in and surgically, next slide, uh, cut out this uh, little uh, fraction of the mammary gland. So now we only have the supporting tissue with no epithelium in it. So what Kendi Ohm showed in the, at UC Berkeley is next, is that you can take mammary epithelial cells from a different animal, or next, um, oh, sorry. Um, so you can take these epithelial cells, transplant them just by injecting into the fat pad, and actually have them grow out again. Next slide. Um, you can also do this with little pieces of tissue. So you don't have to disaggregate or purify the epithelial cells. You can take a piece of tissue from anywhere in this um, ductal tree and put it into a new fat pad 
and it will grow out into a normal mammary gland. It will undergo differentiation and proliferation under the hormones of pregnancy, just as if it had been an endogenous tissue. Now, what's really interesting about this is that we can do this over and over and over again. So we can actually take the mammary epithelium from one animal over here, transplant it into a new animal, let it grow out like this, take a piece of this tissue, transplant it into a new animal, and do that serially for up to five to six to seven generations of, of, of differentiation and proliferation. So this means that there's a reservoir of stem cell capacity in the breast that is um, actually quite profound. It's comparable to the stem cell reservoir in the bone marrow in its ability to generate one generation, one complete new organ after another, after another, after another, even though it has a very limited differentiation um, um, patterning, i.e. in its ability to decide to become an ER positive or ER negative is not quite the same as having to decide between a, a lymphoid and um, um, other uh, cell types of the bone marrow. So this demonstrates there is a stem cell population. And what we're interested in under the program that Janet, uh, descri Janice described to you earlier is we're actually interested in whether or not um, these cells are the origin of cancer. Um, one of the things we know from actually ionizing radiation exposure um, in human populations is that women who are exposed to radiation, which is a, a known carcinogen of human breast, is that if they're exposed during puberty when this development is happening, then they have a higher risk of developing breast cancer much, much later in life. So we're very interested in this period of puberty, and we're very interested in what regulates stem cells. So that's what we're studying under the NIEHS funding. The next slide, what I'm going to do is go to, okay, how we link now this idea of stem cells of the normal tissue and cancer stem cells. So there are two hypotheses, and this is the part we haven't been able to actually discern is which of these is correct um, at this point in time, and it may be that they're both correct. It's important to keep in mind. So one hypothesis is that cancer stem cells are a result of carcinogens like radiation inducing alterations in those stem cells per se. And that would link very nicely with this observation that when humans are exposed to radiation during puberty, they have a higher risk of developing cancer. However, it's also possible that actually the cancer cells use the same signals that regulate stem cell function. And that's why we're seeing this commonality between um, the, the uh, radiation exposure during puberty. The same signals are occurring in those cells. So let's uh, take that a step further. In the next slide, uh, we have what are these signals? These signals for mammary stem cells are the same are the same kind of signals that we know regulate cancer cell growth. So there's the uh, decision to migrate over here. There's the decisions to proliferate or not to proliferate, to self-renew, to stay here or to move. And all these pathways that we know are involved in regulating stem cells have also, the next slide, been linked to cancer. So here's a nice um, um, schematic uh, or slide taken from one of Irving Weissman's uh, papers where they say, okay, here are these proteins. Um, don't really have to really care, except this one's called sonic hedgehog. You know, biologists do have a sense of humor. Um, and this one's called Wint, and this one's called Notch. And in each case, we know a lot about the signaling of how these cells then, these proteins, regulate specific uh, cell fate decisions, as you just heard about, in particular tissues. But we also know that these same proteins are found in, during cancer in specific tissues. So colon carcinoma and epidermal tumors have a, a activation of the Wnt pathway. Brain tumors have activation of sonic hedgehog. And Notch is involved in mammary tumors. So this kind of analogy, these kind of parallels, have led people to test the idea, are stem cells in tumors comparable to stem cells in tissues? So the next slide um, just uh, gives you a brief overview of one of the most um, uh, stimulating, I think, most provocative experiments done in the last um, several years. Actually, this was published in 2003, so it's just about five years old. And it led to a completely different view of how we treat uh, cancer, or prospectively, how we will treat um, cancer. So in this case, this is a group at the University of Michigan led by Michael Clark and Max Witcha. Max Witcha. And what they did is they took human breast tumors, um, a little tumor chunk, 
Um, they disaggregated that into cells, and then they looked for different compartments. Um, these compartments were identified with uh, cell surface markers that you don't need to really pay attention to, but just leave it to say that we can separate these um, uh, mixture into different compartments um, using a technique called flow cytometry. And then what they did next is they took each of these purified populations and injected them into the mammary fat pad that I described earlier of an immune-compromised mouse. So these are human cells into a mouse, but the mouse doesn't reject them because it's immunocompromised. And what they showed is that when you separate this this, this stem cell, uh, these, um, this tumor into these different populations, interestingly, each of these uh, cell surface markers had previously been associated with stem cell function. Then, in the next slide, they showed, um, next, that only certain cells, the cells that are CD24 low, actually form tumors in the mouse. They had these non-tumorgenic, although they were predominant, the non-tumorgenic cells, all coming from the breast cancer specimen, didn't form tumors. They were injected over here. But these other ones could actually form these tumors. And what was interesting about this, is they could take these tumors, disag disaggregate them again, and then show that, again, you had these three different populations of cells. So the cells were able to self-renew, and they were able to differentiate it into uh, diverse populations in the um, uh, during the development of cancer. So why is this important? Next slide is that uh, we think that the biology of tissue-specific stem cells is an important determinant of cancer susceptibility. We really don't know that for sure, that those are the cells that become cancers. It could be that certain aspects of stem cell biology may be recapitulated during cancer development. But what the promise of this um, idea is, is that you can exploit these stem cell-like uh, regulatory markers as a means of controlling cancer. So in the last slide, um, it just uh, summarizes this proposal by Michael Clark and or Weissman in a paper in 2001 where they said that although tumors are all heterogeneous, um, oh, okay, so let me put it this way, the therapeutic consequences is that one view, you think, okay, all the tumors are targets of therapy and you just have to kill enough of them. That's what we uh, generally do now. Um, but if indeed the stem cell hypothesis is true, next then what we really have to do is to control the cancer stem cells, okay? Um, sorry, go back one. Um, the cancer stem cells. So now what we have to do is actually kill these cells. All these other cells are secondary. They don't have the capacity to make a tumor. Whether we kill them or not makes no difference. What we really have to do is focus on targeting this lineage of cells. So in the next slide, it just shows that the idea is that if you have a self-renewing population that is contained within the tumor, if you have therapies that kill non-tumorgenic cells, those cells, those stem cells are going to survive, and so what you're going to get is regression, but not cure. On the other hand, if you have therapies that kill these stem cells, cancer stem cells, you're neither going to get dormancy or this ability to metastasize to other uh, tissues. So um, last slide is just acknowledgement that this kind of research is being funded by the NIEHS under the Bay Area Breast Cancer and the Environment Centers. Thank you.